Yeah, so Robin Hanson almost needs no introduction, but I will uh, go very briefly. He is uh, an economist, a professor, and what I think of as the godfather of prediction markets. Here's Robin Hanson. I was told people wanted to see me sporting the Bowser backpack, so there you go. All right. I'm old. <laughs> 64. I started this long ago. Uh, in 1984, I left grad school at Chicago to go out to Silicon Valley to do AI and what we called hypertext publishing, which was what became the World Wide Web. This was before the web. And I was involved with a group called Xanadu. And they had a vision for how this hypertext publishing, the web, would remake conversation and debate because it would be easy to find rebuttals to bad claims. You are now living in the utopia we envisioned <laughs> where it's easy for you to find rebuttals to bad claims and you never read bad claims anymore, right? Well, maybe not. <laughs> uh, so in this period of, in this group trying to build this vision, I had doubts. <laughs> and this group around me was very libertarian. So I wasn't then. <laughs> Uh, but the idea of betting markets was in the air there as a libertarian thing. And I thought, well, instead of backlinks being the solution to better debate and better conclusions, why not just have the betting market prices? <laughs> that would also cut through the bullshit <laughs> and give us more reliable answers we could all rely on. And so... In 1988, roughly, I started thinking and writing about this. I did a bunch of talks at various Silicon Valley places like, you know, Xerox at the time. I don't know if you remember Xerox. Um, about this idea, I started to write about it. And I had sort of the initial vision that most everyone else has had since then. Uh, maybe I had it first. I, I did try really hard to go look up everybody who had had a similar idea before. So I spent many hours in libraries just trying to scour anybody who had said a similar thing. And I tried to cite them all. And so my difference wasn't having this idea, which is an ancient idea. I was just going farther and saying where this could go. Um, and that was 1988, 89, 90, when I gave all these talks and did these things. Um, so. Since then, in 93, I went back to grad school to get my PhD, and I was intending to you know, work on things like this, uh, except there were some detours there. Uh, but I helped out the first play money prediction market, which was Foresight uh, in 93, which was appearing with the beginning of the World Wide Web. I, still, I think it's still out there, actually. Um, so I was involved in some prediction market projects then in the next decade or so. Um, especially when I got my first job at uh, George Mason, 99. I was involved in the uh, policy analysis market, a DARPA project, uh, involved in making technology for prediction markets, working on lab experiments to test some issues about things that could go wrong. And so over time, I thought more about the power of prediction markets and what they could do and saw more failure modes <laughs> with time and I evolved an opinion about where I thought the gold was. What was the big payoff? And over time, more new people just coming in into the industry. And what I noticed is the new people kept coming in with the same vision I started with. And I would try to say, well, yeah, but you know, this is where the gold is. And over time, people would say, you want to be involved with this project, we're going to do it this way. And I said, well, that's kind of dumb. You don't want to do that that way. You want to do this or technology development projects, which we're fine developing technology, except we just had a huge technology overhand, and we still do. We still have lots of advanced technologies that Manifold isn't going to use for the next 20 years. <laughs> so that just didn't seem so exciting to work on piling more unused technology on. And it didn't seem so exciting to work on projects that I thought were just misconceived. <laughs> so I basically kept not joining projects. And that meant. I sort of, from the views of most people in the prediction market world, drifted out of the world. I wasn't 
running projects. I wasn't giving out money. I wasn't managing things. I wasn't main platforms talking about things, invited keynote speakers. So this is emotionally important to me, but I'm trying to be fair. But the key thing I'm saying is this, I thought, I've always thought this was the best idea I've had in my life. The thing, I, my biggest contribution, but this whole world wouldn't listen to me about where I think the gold is, where I still think it is. So I'm about to tell you that, but I'm warning you that I have an unusual view and you should take that for what it is, right? But they've given me a platform here to try to tell you where I think the gold is, all right? Okay, so let's start with an analogy. Uh, the steam engine, a motor. It's a powerful technology and it's helped make the world rich. If you were the first person with a motor and you wanted to convince the people around you that this was a valuable technology, you could go just hook it up to random things and make them go thwap, 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 <laughs> right? You could stick it in water and make it spizz and water would fly out. You could, you know, make a curtain get all twisted and fall off the wall. You could do a lot of things to show, oh, this, look, this is a thing and it look, look its power, but you wouldn't really inspire a lot of investment or effort because you hadn't really shown it was useful. You just showed it was a thing, right? Um, a, a famous example is uh, the Aztec wheel. As you may know, they found Aztec toys with wheels on them, but they didn't actually use wheels to like transport stuff around. And they plausibly have good reason. They mainly had water and steep hills, so wheels weren't so useful. But the metaphor is, you know, you could get stuck with using something as a toy and not think about how it could actually be powerful. So now I need to make the distinction. What's the first vision people have when they think about prediction markets? When they first enter the field, we first get the idea, what I first had when I first entered the field, and then alternatively, where do I think the big value is? So I think the first thing people think about is um, that we have a world of talk, people talking all the time, as you know, blabbing, and my colleague Alex Tabarak says, betting is a tax on bullshit. We like the idea, oh, People would be bullshitting less if we could push them to bet more. And then this world of talk we have might be a little healthier. And people could even enjoy like pushing other people to go, yeah, you want to bet? That's kind of fun and edgy. And it pushes the world in the right direction. And so you imagine basically supporting that by making a place where people can go, yeah, you want to bet? And if you go there, you offer the bet and then other people feel a little embarrassed or they join, et cetera. But now, you know, rivals respect each other from the fight and you've got a fun world of fighting. And so that's the vision that people typically gravitate to is a idea that we could make a fun fighting game where people were betting on things that people are talking about and then our talk would be healthier and we'd have more fun. And that's the vision that has come to people's minds over and over again in my now 35 years of history <laughs> in this area. And that's a fine thing to do. I'm not saying that shouldn't happen, okay? Uh, I just think there's a much bigger value somewhere else nearby to be achieved. And yes, maybe this is the thing you need to do first before you can do that, but I've seen this happen again and again for 35 years. <laughs> people going for the smaller thing and then maybe achieving it to varying degrees, but what's the other thing? Okay, so uh, I'm an economics professor and a foundation of our field, including not just our field, but business and a lot of people nearby is the concept of decision theory. Decision theory is our best and pretty good theory of how people do and should make decisions. And decision theory says that when you make decisions, you combine your values, your utilities, i.e. what your priorities are, with your beliefs, and your beliefs should be updated with information. And we've got whole standard mathematical theories of how that goes, but the key thing is we can represent the idea of and calculate often the value of information, which is to inform decisions. That is, the reason in decision theory to know more is to make better decisions. And, as an economist, we say, 
The world is full of large organizations where a lot of resources and value is at stake, which make a lot of big decisions where they can make wrong decisions, they often do, and they have large values of information for those decisions. Large, as in millions, tens of millions, even hundreds of millions of dollars of value in a decision. That's the gold in the world out there. Is that is, if we could find a way to get people better information in their decisions, that's just a huge percentage of the value in the world out there to achieve. That's not just a small, cute startup. <laughs> that's a big percentage of world product, right? And world product is what, like 30 trillion, 100 trillion? I guess about 100 trillion. So 1% is $1 trillion a year. That's what we're talking about as the value that could be achieved by making better decisions. So how can we achieve that value? So one of the key things is that you guys are all old enough to have been in many organizations where you can see that the decisions are not reflecting all the available information, right? And you know the reason is that the people who do know or could know things find it hard to communicate with the people making decisions, in particular hard to be trusted by them, and maybe they can get an email to them, but they can't get believed, right? So, and the bigger, the more dysfunctional the organization, the bigger value is sitting there in could we aggregate information better? Could we take the things many people know or could know, combine it together in a way that would be directly relevant for a decision and then make better decisions with higher information value? So it seems to me we, the world is dominated by a lot of large organizations that have a lot of dysfunction. <laughs> anybody over the age of 40 will just agree with me on this. I don't think it's pretty hard to find anybody who would disagree about that who's been around the world. Our world is full of big organizations that just make a lot of bad decisions because they find it hard to aggregate information from all the different people in order to make their decisions. So prediction markets are a proven method for doing exactly that, for having a decision, setting up a market right next to the decision, a question, and then asking a lot of people to contribute that in particular, as a side point, I you know, focused on this concept of decision markets exactly because it best supports this mode. That is, if you, you know, are thinking of some decision, then you make a market on sales or, or competitors' actions. It's often maybe a little hard to tell, well, if I knew that, how exactly would I make a different decision? But a decision market is where you estimate the consequence of a particular decision. So you say, if we open the plant in Memphis or if we open it in Tallahassee, you know, which will have more sales, which will have more profit, et cetera. You just ask directly, what are the consequences of my choice? And then that should give you just directly valuable information about your choice. So we know mechanically, in a sense, how to set up a market to inform decisions. And we expect there's many trillions of dollars of value on the table here because the world is basically driven by decisions and a lot of decisions are just made not on full information. So this is the potential at stake here. Like, and not only that, like if you think about all the policy and charitable and causes you care about, AI risk or global warming or whatever it is, you probably believe that the main reason we're not doing better on that is we aren't aggregating information well enough to agree together about what the problems are and what to do about them. So a better mechanism here not only would make trillions of dollars in business, it would make the world much better literally for all the other problems you care about. Um, that's because that's exactly what it, the potential is. And in some sense, those are the decisions we, are, we do the worst at at aggregating information. <laughs> These big policy decisions or politics and everything's all mixed up with it. All right, so huge potential value. Uh, but how do we achieve that value? And how does that relate to this other thing I talked about, the image of a world of talk making a fun game where people are challenging each other and fighting each other to better be truth? The key distinction here, I would say, is like this analogy with uh, the motors. So the way motors actually worked and the way most industries should work and do work, really, is once you have a motor, 
you go look for the highest value application that you can use on that motor. Initially, it was, for steam engines, pumping water out of mines, right? So your first application is going to have to be sensitive to, like, the, the features of your initial version, how easy they are to move, to repair, what sort of fuels they need, you know, what size, et cetera. So they made motors for, vine, for, for pumping out waters out of mines, and that was a big enough, important enough application that they could sell a lot of copies of motors and then build up a scale where then they could then try out motors and something else, like trains, boats, things like that, right? So the lesson here is, if, if you just say, gee, a motor's a cool thing, let's put a motor on the palace door, the king's got to see that, and then the king will think it'll look cool, and then the world will want to do this thing, right? But the market for motors on palace doors is really tiny. But that is what often happens in these areas. People look for the most flashy application, like people say, hey, prediction markets, let's apply them to, I don't know, predicting AI risk or something. Okay, cool, but like, that's a really tiny market. <laughs> you want to go for the really big markets. That's what you always want, right? Uh, when, when you're making wheels and trying to sell them, you don't want wheels on toys. Well, maybe that's a decent market, but you don't want wheels on you know, doors or something. You want wheels on carts, <laughs> if there's a lot of carts. The first computers, they, they were general computers, but they weren't useful until you had software that did high-value applications, uh, you know, accounting, for example, where there's just a huge amount of value, lots of customers, you know you can do it with the first version of the, of the product. Okay, so this vision says to untap this enormous value, we have to go application by application, starting with some stereotyped, you know, thing of value where there's a lot of versions of it in the world, and when you add up those versions, there's a lot of value, and it's not that hard to do because your first, you know, first versions aren't so good, right? So for that, we look at the world and we say, people are making decisions out there. Where are the highest value decisions that an organization often does badly because you know, in, you know, the people making the decision don't know things other people know? and where this just happens over and over again, all over the place, and it's high enough value that, and you can just do it simply enough that you could go for that market. That's what you want to do is find the first thing like that, and then not just like throw up a general platform and say, hey, figure it out yourself. <laughs> you would be, just like with the pumps or whatever, you would be designing a particular version of the product for that application, and then Tr trying it out in that context enough to get a track record of success so that you could then go to further customers and say, look, we've already done these many customers like you this way. Here's our price and service for you and we'll hold your hand. And then, you know, then you have a product, right? So, like, you don't just hand somebody a motor and say, this motor could be used to pump water. <laughs> you have motors pumping waters a lot of times and you know how you need to structure that motor to make that work, you know, what happens if it gets flooded or, you know, how to repair it or how to haul it down there, et cetera. You work out the details of that application so that you convince the next customer that you can just come in and do it for them. This isn't them experimenting. This is a thing that's already worked out that you're just buying. That's how most people want to buy products. They want to buy a thing that's already worked out and they just buy it and somebody else did the experimenting. Right? Obviously, somebody's going to be willing to be the first experimenter, but they're going to take a, you know, you're going to give them a big price cut <laughs> to be in that role, right? So, in prediction markets, if I ask what are the biggest high initial value things, the, f the thing that most often comes to my mind is new hires. Almost any organization with 20 people hires two to four new people every year, okay? If not more. Right? And for every new hire you consider, uh, you, know, you, you might have, you have different rounds, but in the last round you might consider, say, three times as many people as you have slots. Four times as many people have slots, right? So you could do a prediction market in that last round of, for each of the people you're considering this last round, if we hire them, what will we think of that choice in a year or two? You know, that, that's the usual metric for hiring people, right? What do we, and, and most organizations have the practice of having some sort of employee evaluation where you rate people after 
yearly. So that fits straightforwardly into standard practice. Now, many people say that the employee evaluations they do aren't actually serious and they don't actually do it accurately and they're just trying to motivate people with it. You'd have to do better than that, but um, that's high value. <laughs> and you would, of course, invite the people who, who interviewed these people, the pe other people in the organization who saw their resume, et cetera, to review them and to bet on who would be a good hire. Uh, so that's, a, that's an example of what I'm thinking of that if you're going to make a business like this, you're going to want to make a system designed around that application. And then you go to a firm, you say, we've already done this 10 times with other people. Here's how it goes. <laughs> you know, at this date, you, you, know, you give us the list of people, then we, you need the people you're going to invite to participate, and then this is how it's going to look, and then here's the materials that everybody's going to have. And you know, you're going to have done it enough times to recommend things. So all innovation is a combination of a few elegant ideas and a lot of messy details. <laughs> Right? And the whole point of doing those initial versions of something is to work out those messy details, which I don't know yet. <laughs> and so the whole, the, my whole point of recommendation is, if you want to go for this gold, you need to be willing to take the time to work out those details about each particular application, i.e., who's allowed to trade in this market, who's allowed to see what, when are the decisions made, are they reversed, what the time scale of, uh, you know, et cetera is. That's how you would do this one or any of them. And that's what we haven't seen so far so much of. That is, in the model of you just have a place where people can go challenge each other to bets, you haven't gone through that work for some particular application. And so you could say, hey, you got a new hire. Why don't you come onto my platform and make some markets? And they all, how exactly do I do that? And you go, we don't know. You figure it out. And that's not terribly inspiring <laughs> for someone to come and want you know, to get that product. Sure, you've offered a cheap price because you're making them do most of the work. Right? Other examples, deadlines, famously. Um, almost all organizations have projects with deadlines. And they do kind of want to know if they're going to make the deadlines. There are many issues with respect to exactly how to define the deadline and what variations to consider. I mean, it's not just will you make the deadline, but what changes could change the chance I'll make the deadline? What personnel changes, priority changes, definition changes, feature requirement changes, et cetera. Uh, budget changes, how would they affect, will I, will I make the deadline? Uh, years ago, we had many experiments. Many of, this was a very popular initial application because it's very simple. And we certainly had the problems where people don't really want to know if they're going to make the deadline. <laughs> and that's the sort of thing you need to work out. But again, that's exactly the sort of messy details that you need to work through by actually doing a set of real applications and trying out different variations until you find the way to do it that works better. So, so I, I mean, in some sense, this is the answer to the why is this hard in business question. Well, it's going to be hard in business if you just come in and do it the most straightforward way in a blunt, straight, <laughs> in a blunt direct way, because business doesn't like blunt and direct about sensitive, important things, right? You got to finesse it. <laughs> this needs to be finessed. That doesn't mean it's not possible. It means you got to experiment with how to finesse it. You have to try different things to see how to finesse it. And so, I mean, relatedly, as you probably know, a lot of prediction market activity in the last 10 years has been based in blockchain. And com even compared to other software companies, blockchain companies are even worse about we don't face customers. We don't talk to customers. We build tools and platforms and let somebody else build, figure it out on top, right? And, you know, that they'd be even worse about that. Um, I used to work with Consensus Point a long time ago, and they started out with this generic prediction market platform for companies, but they switched to their focus application was focus groups. And at the time, the other main successful application was replacing which new, res new uh, sort of research projects to try. So, so let's just walk through these a little detail so you, there's a lesson to be learned from them. <laughs> uh, the focus group application was, you know, instead of coming in a focus group and like chatting and then, you know, voting on something, you bet about which products you think will win in the, in the betting market and then you find that more engaging and fun, but you basically tell us the same thing, which, things, which versions do you like? 
in those betting markets, they didn't actually settle the final price on any real outcome. They just settled it on the final price because it was just a fun, engaging thing to basically ask a poll question. Uh, and the other main application was basically when an organization had some budget to say, let's try some new things, and people would suggest new things, they would need a way, well, which new things do we pick? And they found, oh, let's have a betting market on which new projects to try where they settled the bets on the final price. <laughs> Again, not connecting it to truth. And notice in both of these cases, they're not really using the function of prediction markets to give you an incentive to be truthful. They're using the function of prediction markets as a fun little game that we can all get behind and enjoy, which is a value, but it's kind of sad not to use that. And the other thing to notice about these things is they stay away from things where managers have opinions about the topic. So as, as we, you know, for, like for deadlines often, the problem is somebody's running a project with a deadline, you introduce a market on a deadline, and then it says you're not going to make your deadline, and this manager's pissed because <laughs> he didn't like this message. And you know, he can't kill the market until after it's over, but then it's no more and it won't happen again. So just generically, uh, like I remember I, I got to talk with the ex-CEO of Google for 15 minutes once, Schmidt, and I was able to show him how conditional prediction markets worked and he realized, you know, hey, he didn't understand that, that was cool, but he had a speech about prediction markets, all prepared, so it's clearly a thing he had thought about. And he said, well, see, at Google, we don't want prediction markets because we're all about the visionaries and we need each project to have a visionary who runs it. And if some market says no, that's like a naysayer and a kind of a downer and we don't need downers about our visionaries because our visionaries just need to be inspired and go with their vision. That, that was Schmidt's story. <laughs> um, and, and basically, Google had these markets internally where they had play money markets about Lots of Google events, and it was run by somebody who you know, used their 20% to set it up, and it was successful for a while, and somebody got some academic publications about it. But talking to Schmidt and other executives, they said, we never intended to care internally about those markets. That was just for an external product we hoped you might get. We don't need to know anything these markets might tell us. Uh, it's other people who might want to know stuff. So this shows you the obstacles there, but again, Remember the gold. Like most of the world value is out there is because we grow and make better decisions over time. We make a lot of bad decisions because we don't aggregate information from as many people as we could. There's really trillions of dollars sitting in that possibility of doing that better. And it's waiting on people to do the first things so that somebody else can just not be an experimenter but just take an early product. That's what this whole industry is waiting on. And it has been for 35 years, and unfortunately at this rate, it may be another 50 years <laughs> before we get there. There's no obvious thing that's going to force people to do this because, you know, it is fun to just bet and, and fight and, you know, play a game. And uh, it, it does make the world better. I absolutely agree <laughs> that people betting for fun, for fight, makes the world better. And it can pave the way for these other things. But in essence, these other things won't happen unless people have ventures where they specifically try to do them. Right? You set up a, a project where you say, we're going to be trying to help people do new hires. We're going to you know, get five different companies to be our trial bases. We're going to go in there and set up markets there, try them five different ways or 20 different ways, see which ones work better, find out what the problems are, get a track record, and then we've got a product that we can sell to other people for a lot of money. That is because huge amount of value is on the table for making better new hires in most organizations. And that's just one of many, many decision market applications that are out there potentially here. And that's my vision of where the gold lies in prediction markets, in betting markets. Um, there's gold in them, there are hills. It's just the hills after the ones you're on but they're not that far away. And there's a lot more gold there than the gold nuggets you've been finding on this hill. I mean, it's good that you went to this hill and got these nuggets. That's great. I agree. But at some point, I want to inspire greed. The hill over there, the next one over, it's got, you can even see them from here. Take out your scope. Big, shiny gold nuggets glinting in the sunlight. 
You just have to go through that valley up to the other side and take the gold. That's my talk. <laughs> so I've left lots of time for discussion and questions here. Oh, could you hold on a sec? We'll get you on the mic, just so it's recorded, yeah. So let's say you set up your market for hiring, um, and you have people place bets based on evaluations at the one-year mark for the people who get hired. You hire some people, the market is getting some calibration, and the individual traders are finding out who's good and who's bad at predicting who's gonna do well. But you don't find counterfactually how the people you didn't hire would have done. I guess maybe this is wading into the details. Do you advocate for you know doing this for some percentage of hires and then seeing does the selection via prediction markets outperform people who are being hired via the old mechanism? How do you deal with the counterfactuals of the decisions that get made? So decision markets as a mechanism are basically conditional bets, i.e. if this happens, then what would happen as a consequence? The conditional bet mechanism is completely incentive compatible in the sense that it gives you the incentive to say what you really believe about each condition. Now, in the extreme scenario where you have some decision rule that's based on the market about what you'll do, then you might be absolutely sure a certain scenario will never happen. But I'm not recommending that. Uh, so certainly early in the market, even if you see a favorite, you won't be sure it'll stay the favorite. So you still think there's a chance of each of the options, and that gives you an incentive to give your accurate estimate on them. So mechanically, the markets work just fine when there are many options and you aren't sure which one's going to be the one chosen. If somehow you, were at, you get to a position of being absolutely sure, then you no longer get information on the ones you're sure won't happen, but that's just usually not a problem. It certainly wouldn't be a problem for new hires. I mean, the reason why you picked each candidate is because you thought there was a shot at them being a final choice and you know, it would be very late in the process where you got to a point where you're sure they're not going to be, in which case, I think that works fine. Any other questions? Are they back? So I guess we all here uh, agree that uh, different crowd information aggregation uh, algorithms such as prediction markets can be really useful in uh, aggregating information and uh, making decisions. And decisions are sometimes, uh, as you uh, described, uh, your idea for gold, uh, are very about very similar things, repetitive, that happen many times and give you the time to optimize around that process. But I think in the experience, uh, in practice, what tends to happen uh, in when businesses are facing this situation, they just set up some kind of internal algorithmic forecasting system using machine learning or something. And that's uh, that's maybe not as good as uh, aggregation of human knowledge for some outliers where something special is unique about, let's say, the job candidate, right? But most of the time, these algorithms might just work enough to keep uh, decision makers happy. So uh, I'd, uh, I guess my question would be, like, uh, how could uh, prediction markets squeeze out this like, default familiar solution to just set up a machine to forecast for your decision? So uh, I guess I, I might have assumed more background here. Uh, we have had many dozens of trials in the last decades where we had a prediction market forecast something at the same time some other prior mechanism forecasted that same thing with similar resources. And we have a very consistent track record there that either the prediction market is about the same or substantially better. So that substantially better than would give you a basis for estimating the value of the information that you will get by making better decisions using this mechanism. So we can actually financially estimate this value. So that is, I can tell you, this isn't just a speculation. Like we can say, you know, for example, uh, if we had that level of accuracy with respect to hires, we know how much we lose by having worse candidates for hire. We can estimate that dollar. So we can put a dollar value on these sorts of 
better. That's the whole point of having the value of information calculation is we can actually calculate the value of information and we can show you the amount of information through these experiments put those two things together, and that's the basis of saying there's trillions of dollars of value here. It's not, you know, so, so obviously firms do make do with whatever they have, right? The pitch is, don't you want to do a little better? Um, now, I, I, I do think that, in fact, in most organizations, um, they talk a bigger game about trying to be scientific and informative than they actually do. That is. Most managers in most organizations, their presentation, their, for their, the image they want to say is, I'm a spreadsheet calculator. I'm, I've got all these numbers I'm collecting, and I'm trying to make the best decisions. And when I figure it all out, I'll let you know. That's what I do. I collect numbers, and I put them together, and I calculate. And in fact, managers are kind of more often politicians. <laughs> they have a coalition that they need to support. And so they're less willing to allow sources of information they can't control to influence their decision-making processes. But still, I, as an economist, I can be confident at the level of the organization, there is a lot of value, even if individuals aren't so eager to achieve it. So when I was uh, yelling at various uh, prediction market builders to build decision markets where only one of the options resolves NA and have like organizational internal compartments where only people inside the organization can see it and allow anonymous betting for people so that like people could do things that they didn't necessarily want their managers to see them immediately doing. Okay, so that, that's what I was yelling at them to do. What am I missing besides like the decision markets where only one resolves, the organizational internal compartments like the enterprise edition and anonymous betting, what else am I missing? So that sounds like sort of an artisanal bespoke construction of each new question, which is what I'd warn against. That is, instead of saying, hey, if we have a two-hour meeting, we can add one question every two hours if we talk a lot about it and add questions, which ends up adding to a lot of expense, I'd say pick a very standardized kind of problem, like new hiring, and then just build a system and do that one over and over and over again without much artisanal <laughs> discussion or construction. Just find a standardized application and get good at that. Uh, or say deadlines or you know, allocation of resources. So for example, you, know, you have different salespeople. You could assign them to different regions, which salespeople should be assigned to with different regions. Um, you, know, you have how often should we do maintenance on things. <laughs> There's, there's just a whole world of decisions organizations make, but instead of going to one organization and say, hey, tell me about all your decisions, <laughs> and trying to make a market one at a time for each of their decisions, I'd say, let's, as a business, pick our area, like new hires or deadlines or whatever it is, let's design a business around that, then let's get customers and have them practice that, and make a product that does that reliably, <laughs> cost effectively, et cetera, make a product oriented around that and sell that. Uh, that's you know, going to be the way most other, again, like the motors thing. Like you could, have a, you, know, you could have a booth on the street where I say, look, I've got 20 different kinds of motors. You want a motor? Anybody want a motor? <laughs> and maybe someone would buy your motors. <laughs> that's not the best way to sell motors. The way to sell motors is you go find a thing people want to use a motor for, maybe a grinder. You figure out what kind of motor makes a good grinder. You attach the other things onto the motor that make the grinder. Then you grind a bunch of stuff. You show people, look, how much stuff you can grind with my motor. And you sell them a grinder, not a motor, right? <laughs> That's the story here. The th product you want to sell is closer to the customer and what they want. And your technology should be inside your product, not at forefront. You want to sell them a solution to their problem, not a technology. Um, hey, Robin. So I have a question in terms of not doubting the informational validity from crowdsource predictions, but outsort, outside of monetary incentives, what's the case for prediction markets over prediction polls like Metaculus or Good Judgment Open? Um, you know, there was the Ville Satapa paper, you know, uh, the, the bin model of forecasting, which, you know, found that prediction markets were a very good method, but that super forecasters or just proper algorithms on prediction polls 
produce better forecasts. So w what's the case besides obviously the monetary aspect for prediction markets? In those variations, I'll first call your attention to the super forecasters. I'd say, if you want to go into an organization and have them decide who to hire, they aren't really going to want to hire some super forecasters from outside the organizations to review their hires, right? I just don't think it works to create a special panel of good forecasters to deal with most organizational problems. You're going to be attracting the people in those organizations who know, who are close to those problems to participate, and they'll be the ones you want to have participating. I actually, I mean, in this whole field, people have often argued over even different kinds of markets like market maker versus, you know, book orders versus automated market maker versus, you know, uh, different ways to represent the interface. And then there's all these different forecasting aggregation mechanisms. I have opinions about them, but my highest level opinion is you get, that's the wrong thing to be thinking about. If you use any one of those and get the rest of this right, you've got to win. Right, that's, those variations are small. In general, of course, I mean, this should sound trivial, but I'll say it. Um, if applying any technology, the main thing is like find a value out there where somebody actually wants something, find a way to get that thing, and then the inputs that would be needed for that, and then the, the thing in the middle that combines the inputs to get the output, well, later on you can optimize that, but just get something there. <laughs> And that's the focus. Focus first on just achieving some value for someone in some plausible way. And don't you know, agonize too much over things that don't make that much difference. Testing? Cool. Uh, Robin, I'm curious if I could get you to steel man uh, Eric Schmidt's case against prediction markets. Uh, like, one example argument I can think of is there's not that much more truth, there's not that much more information to be squeezed out um, of prediction markets relative to the existing aggregation mechanism and the cost to like group cohesion of having naysayers betting against the visionary are just like too high in the vast majority of business decisions. But I'm curious what your steel man would be. Um, we've only had large organizations for a couple of centuries now, a tiny time period in all of human history. We're still bad at it. We still don't actually know very much about how to manage large organizations. A few centuries from now, they will just know a lot more about how to do these things. And how to do this involves lots of little details. And many of those details matter from the point of view of motivating and you know mo morale and who knows what etc so i don't think i should be making any broad specific claims the idea is just look there's this big space of designing more organizations and this should be one of the things you're varying in your search for better organizations and that's exactly why i say you need to do this period of taking a particular application and doing a lot of experimentation exactly to find in some industry or whatever the ways that there you can avoid the morale problems, avoid the et cetera problems. But I can just tell you from having worked in many organizations, and most any, anybody over 40 can tell you this too, our actual real organizations quite often make decisions ignoring a lot of information available. That's just a thing we all know, right? Yes, there's a lot of details about how exactly to do it, and I don't know. That's the whole point, is you need to be searching in this space, but there's just so much value to be achieved by searching in this space that we ought to be searching. Hi, um, two problems that I think come to mind personally when it comes to like using prediction decision markets in a corporate setting is that I guess you have ego and feelings um, as well as perverse incentives. Like let's say you uh, made a prediction that someone would be a bad candidate. You're now incentivized in a way to make them look bad and kind of have a bad evaluation, for example. How do you overcome some of these problems? Like, do you have to completely isolate the predictors and the doers and the evaluation entirely? How does that work out? So wherever you would use a prediction market to influence a decision, 
If you just take out the decision market and look at what you're doing now, you will typically see all those same problems. <laughs> it's already true that if you know, we hire you, and in the interview, I told other people, he's shit, he shouldn't hire him, and you still hire him, and I'm still going to want to take you down so I look better. Like, that the prediction market doesn't change that, right? So the question is, the differential effect, how different is it with this versus that? And again, we have many mechanisms to deal with that. I'm happy to walk through one by one many different ways we could deal with these problems. For, let me just give you an example just to reassure you how things exist. So for deadlines, one of the problems would be well, someone could just tank the project and make sure that it doesn't make the deadline, and that would be a thing you might incentivize them to do by letting them bet on the deadline. So a simple solution is just to have anybody who could plausibly tank the project start them out with a positive stake, and they can't below, bet it below zero. So they always have a positive value of making the deadline. They can reveal their information by betting up and down more or less positive, but just make sure it's always positive. Similarly with, co with colleagues. Uh, you know, I would, I would want to make sure that each of your colleagues has a positive stake in you doing well in the organization. <laughs> they can, if, they, if they don't like you as much, they might bet you down, but not below zero. They should always have a positive stake in all their colleagues. And that would be a way to avoid have people having a financial incentive to tank their colleagues because they bet against them. But of course, they're still going to have this verbal incentive <laughs> that they already have now. You can short by getting shorter when you're long. <laughs> you, you reveal all the information from shorting by going shorter from long. The, the, the initial position doesn't affect how much information you reveal in your trade. So just let people go shorter or longer who are all long, <laughs> and then you avoid the incentive for sabotage. So that's just one example of many kinds of things that we've thought through. But the point is there's probably more things that we haven't. You're not going to figure this all this out unless you get into particular applications <laughs> and just start experimenting. And that's the thing we just haven't seen enough of. That's my basic story here. Uh, oh, sorry. So a short summary of um, some of the thoughts of Ronald Coase is that you have, like firms are these sort of islands of command economy and they're surrounded by um, markets and that the border between a firm and a market is determined by when the transaction cost of just having you know, fixed relationships, fixed prices, et cetera, is lower than the benefit of better information from prices. So I'm wondering, like, if firms don't use prediction markets enough, does that imply that um, the average firm is too big and we just need many smaller firms and more you know, 1099 contractors than full-time employees, more piecework well, contracts instead of hourly wages, et cetera? No. <laughs> OK. Um. If you just have this model, there's two kinds of things in the world. There's command and markets. Then in that model, you say, ah, prediction markets are markets. Therefore, that's anti-command. I think that's <clears throat> way too simplified. What you should think about is in a hierarchy, people toward the top of the hierarchy are extremely constrained in their attention and information and what they can do. So one of the main ways to improve organizations is to look at all the tasks on the plate of people high up in the hierarchy and say, what can we take off their plate? <laughs> and we have, in fact, over the years, taken more things off their plate. <laughs> things they used to do, we said, no, we can have a specialist and have them do that instead. So often managers say, the thing I do is predict. And the response is, no, you mostly do other things. <laughs> and these are, you know, if I can take a prediction and take that off your plate, that's good for the organization because you've got lots of other things to do. There's just no risk that managers are going to go out of business for a lack of things to do <laughs> if we have them do fewer predictions. <laughs> so, you know, they are necessarily now forced to make many predictions and make many decisions based on their own personal predictions. But when it's feasible to take that off their plate, <laughs> delegate to some other group to make a prediction, that's going to generically be a win uh, because then they can focus more on the other things. I mean, in particular, like the managers get to have to choose the options that you're predicting between. <laughs> they have to choose the metrics you're forecasting. They have to choose the decisions you're considering between. It's harder to have a market choose those. It's possible. But again, you can still see the first thing you'd want to do is have the manager choose <laughs> the options to be considered and the, and the outcomes that are relevant. And then they can go on to the next thing, because now they have a way to delegate that to somebody else. Um, I gave. One and only one talk at Harvard Business School in my life. <laughs> and my Harvard Business School talk was about the idea of how you could 
have information accounting. So in most organizations, you do cost accounting, but you don't do information accounting. That is, when you sit down at a meeting, for example, and people say various things and then a decision is made, you don't account for which information contributed to that decision or who took what positions on that. That's all left to various vague memory, which often isn't very good, about who actually puts which way. Information accounting would then try harder to account for that information. So the key idea would be each division offers questions to the rest of the organization by subsidizing and saying, we want answers to these questions. And then everybody in the organization is authorized to go look at all the questions in the organization and say, could I contribute to this? And so your manager would give you a budget to go trade on all the markets in the rest of the company. And you would only make small trades initially, but if you tend to be successful, your manager might say, oh, you're doing well, let's give you more. And then when you made money in markets about other organizations, that would basically be a color of money transfer. That is, your organization would get credit for the value of information you gave to the other organizations through improving better trades in the market. And now your manager might allocate more of your time to providing this service to other organizations, just like people often authorize people to be liaisons to other organizations. And this would be a way of doing information accounting uh, by people asking the questions, by subsidizing them, and people getting credit for answering the questions, and then the organization gets transfers that represent that credit. That's an example of how you could more systematically uh, you know, go in this direction. I, I don't have great confidence this is exactly the right way to do it, but the point is, I'm trying to show you, I, you know, I've tried to think about this, <laughs> And there are a lot of possibilities. And when you see that vision, you can now suddenly imagine organizations could be pretty different than they are now. They, I, I like to give you the sort of science fiction vision, like you have that moment of recognition of a strange, shiny future with some scary elements. That's science fiction. And I'm trying to give you the science fiction vision here. Organizations could be different. In particular, they could do more information accounting. They could be more explicit about accounting for who contributed information to what decisions, and who offered to pay for those. Um, I, I guess a key framing, so the, the usual business model for prediction markets is we're going to have a place where people can go challenge each other to bets, and then they will. And in that scenario, the main customer is the better, the, the person who wants to make the bets. And you're providing that customer with the service of letting them make these challenges and bets. In this alternative vision I've been describing, it's about a marketplace between buyers and sellers of information. The sellers of information, all the people who could trade but would rather do something else maybe unless you induce them enough to come trade, the buyers of the information are people who want to know the answers to questions such that, i.e., in each organization, do they, will they make their deadline, who, do they, who should they hire, things like that. So the vision here is of a workplace of prediction markets, not a fun game place where People who actually value information pony up money to pay for it explicitly about a question that they label and pay for, and then other people are enticed to come in and supply the information they have offered to pay for. And of course, then you can crank up the dial on how much information you're willing to pay to get more information. And of course, you know, Manifold already has something like that, right? But it's not the main business model imagined, right? But it could move in that direction. Then that's, that's the thing I'm offering in, as a vision here is that that would be the successful industrial business version of these things where the main customer is the people who want to know things. All right. Um, I think that's actually all the time for questions we have. But um, Robin will be hosting office hours tomorrow at 2 um, p.m. Um, so if you have more questions, you'll have an hour to ask some questions then. Um, thank you so much, Robin. Really appreciate it. <laughs>